I'm Tanvi Maheshwari. I'm the Associate Director of Future Cities Lab Global, and I'm very pleased today to launch our new talk series, FCL Overtures. Um, I request everyone to keep their microphones muted. This whole session is going to be recorded and we would be sharing it with our, uh, so our social network as well as all the people in our mailing list. So uh, I appreciate if you keep the microphones muted, but feel free to use the chat function to pose questions, comments, or whatever reactions you have. Uh, so we want it to be an interactive session. So FCL overtures, the research overtures, what does overtures mean? Well, the term overtures, uh, as you might be familiar with this, uh, the more popular meaning as an orchestral piece of music that opens an opera. Literally, the term overture means a beginning or a commencement. It's a proposal to open negotiations or establish new relationships, according to the Webster Dictionary. It is also an open and exposed place. And in this spirit, we are launching the FCL Research Overture to introduce the new research topics that we are developing here in FCL Global. This is a five-year program that we launched earlier this year. Many of you attended the launch event in March under the auspices of um, NRF and ETH Zurich. And we are based in two hubs, Singapore and Switzerland. And we're working in collaboration with three universities in Singapore, NUS, NTU, and SUTD. The program at Scale Global brings together scientists, designers, engineers, and policymakers to develop solutions for sustainable future cities and settlement systems. In the coming months in the FCL Research Overture series, you will hear from our research teams about their aims, their aspirations, and the challenges that they expect to face in the next five years in the process of their research. And we hope to spark a lively dialogue that will help shape our research here in the lab at the very early stages together with you. Today, I'm pleased to kickstart this series with the principal and co-investigators leading the Agropolitan Territories Research Module. Stephen Kenz is the PI leading the project. He's also the director of FCL Global in Singapore. Uh, we have with us Dr. Jessica Deal, who is an assistant professor in School of Design and Environment in NUS. And finally, we have Dr. Janice Lee, uh, assistant professor in Asian School of Environment at NTU. Professor Johan Six, who is also a co in FCL in this research module and chair of sustainable Agro-system, agro-ecosystems in ETH Zurich is um, expected to join us, but he's caught up somewhere. Uh, uh, we hope he can make it in time. Uh, so welcome everyone. Stephen, uh, I want to pass on the megaphone to you uh, to kickstart this session. If you could give us a quick introduction of what Agropolitan Territories module is. Thanks a lot. Um, thanks everybody, or am I muted? I'm unmuted, right? Everybody can hear me? Yeah. Yes, it's clear. Um, thanks everybody for, for coming. Thanks for the introduction, Tanvi. Um, I really like this uh, uh, definition of, of, of the overture. It's an opening, it's invitation, but also it's an exposed place. I'm certainly feeling that at the moment because the program has, has just begun. So we really welcome your questions um, um, after this, this discussion. Um, let, how did I just go to? Um, Tanvi, in a way, has already uh, announced these names, but I'm, I'm simply going to give you a sort of framework for the way modules are. There are eight modules in Future Cities Lab. Uh, they're typically led by uh, two or three or four uh, academics, and then a number of researchers built around a particular theme. As you can see, it's my great pleasure and honor to be uh, the PI of this, of this module, and I'm working with Johan Six, who's an agro-ecosystem uh, uh, agro scientist. He's based in, um, in Zurich. We got to know each other around the shaping of the particular uh, theme of this, and that is very important, and it's a discussion, um, a theme we can come back to as we go along. I'm very pleased to be joined by Jessica Deal, who we'll hear from, as well as uh, Janice Lee. Uh, a number of collaborators, uh, not all of whom I've listed here, but Paolo Vigano um, in, in Lausanne and EPFL. Uh, um, Matty DeMont is a very important uh, a collaborator through uh, the International Rice Research Institute. Uh, Devi Sari Tunas, uh, who is a very significant figure for us around the question of governance. Um, it would have been even more exciting to announce to you the names of our postdoctoral researcher and urban design coordinator, 
both of whom are very talented uh, people, but um, our HR department has simply not given them the, the letter of offer just yet. So next time we meet, I hope I can introduce you to those, uh, to those people. And finally, the dotted lines at the bottom, uh, there are a number of future re uh, further researchers that will be joining. And the spirit of the module is very much to do with the kind of consortium, uh, uh, consortium approach. And I'll, I'll reflect on that a little bit um, towards the end of this, these slides. So what are the big issues? In a way, the big issues here are ones that we share with the FCL uh, program. And they're ones that I suppose we all know uh, in, different, in different levels of granularity. Rapid urbanization, population growth intensification, uh, perhaps uh, not quite so well known is the de-densification of cities. Cities are simply sprawling as they urbanize, they're occupying more land. So the physical footprint of cities is growing faster than is their population growing. Um, and then of course, the, the secret, secret damage of that, of course, is not only the consumption of land, uh, through physical footprints, but of course the, the, the enlarged ecological footprints which reach far beyond the city boundaries and can reach halfway around the world depending where your food comes from, your technology comes from, if you eat meat or not, etc, etc. So we know this is a very, very significant series of issues which are attached to this question of, of urbanization. And that's only the urban perspective. If we slip over point four, five, and 6, these tend to be rural questions the consequences uh, uh, of, the, of the urbanization, which are less familiar to us. Uh, the countryside is being depopulated, it's aging, it's being hollowed out. Often the very old and the very young are left behind. Um, those who are wealthy enough or skilled enough will go to the city to find higher paying jobs. Uh, those who are poor or unable to travel are often left behind. And the capacity to steward the land, to look after the land is also diminished. And this opens up uh, in a way to a kind of industrialization drive, which is directly linked to feeding those urbanizing mouths and urbanizing, um, urbanizing uh, families. And then finally, of course, we know that the environmental degradation and eventually the rise of greenhouse gases are all tied up with this question, all of which is contestable um, and all of which can be refined and qualified in much greater detail depending where you are in the world. But this is roughly the kind of broader framework that FCL is looking at. Primarily, the first point's typically city-centric, and our push is to, in a way, break the city-centric framework of this relatively well understood uh, a series, uh, this, this kind of analytical kind of framework, to try and take the perspective from the countryside inside this larger, this larger question. Um, there has been some work, we're not the only ones, but we think it's a relatively minor tradition that we would like to grow. So this very important article from uh, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences from two or three years ago, this is mapping the physical footprint of, of, of the expansion of cities into fertile countryside food growing regions. And that represents this, this matter of the physical expansion. But what it doesn't do, this is already damaging uh, enough, but what it doesn't do is capture this ecological uh, footprint, which of course goes hand in hand with the rising consumption habits of urbanites. And down the bottom are two, uh, two diagrams. One, I mean, we, we sort of know that the, the story, these are produced every two or three years by the, by the UN through the urbanization prospects. And we're interested in that delta between the red line and the green line. So the red line is the urbanizing populations. The green line is the, uh, is the left behind population, the diminishing rural population. And our big question is what happens in that triangle between those two lines? And our first answer is to hack that diagram, as you can see in the right, which say, of course, we can't split the urban and the rural in quite simple, neat ways. There are already quasi-urban conditions like the exurb and the suburb, and there are already quasi-rural conditions that, are look, that look urban, like, uh, like Desakota conditions, for example. So we've simply hacked it to try and demonstrate that this is already conceptually a problematic diagram. So not only do we want to kind of understand what happens when these lines are bifurcating, we want to look at the different forms and the different spatial configurations and the different systems that, that result from that, or the, the lack of systems, if you like, that result uh, from that environment, from that condition. 
So here are some immediate responses. Um, the first is uh, to theorize, um, and here we, uh, we would acknowledge the work of Chris John Schmidt and Neil Brenner, who perhaps are some of the, the, the leading theorists in, uh, in this, uh, around this problematic, um, and to break with the spell of city-centric urbanization. So urbanization is relentlessly understood as a city-centric city question. It's about the, after all, it's about the migration of people from the countryside to the city. So surely this is a kind of city-centric question. Um, of course, it does have profound uh, uh, challenges and dilemmas for cities, and they are not going to go away. And there will be more cities, and they will be larger, and they will be more heavily populated. So the question of density, all the kind of classic sort of uh, city responses still are in play. But we would like to add another dimension, as, as I've already suggested. And one way to begin to do that is to break the kind of spell of city centricity, as, as, uh, as, I, as I've called it. And once we break that spell, we can start to see that urbanization effects are rampant across the countryside. And that means we have to think about urbanization in a much larger framework. And here we are fellow travelers, absolutely, with Christian uh, Schmidt and, and Neil Brenner, and of course, uh, 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 Melissa Topalovich and other colleagues in the FCL programs. So one way, once you theorize your way through that, we have to find new ways of seeing. So we have to understand rural and agricultural data, environmental data in relation to urban data uh, in ways that we've never done before. Uh, the city-centric spell often turns into data silos so you can get city data. Uh, it's to do with city experiences, but it's very hard to cross hatch that data with environmental data. Uh, even if you look at the, the way the structure of the UN uh, data gathering units, UN Habitat is different from FAO, for example. So how do you intersect that data is already a kind of challenge. So new ways of seeing, um, and we specifically mean here a, a particular kind of software that we, we've been working on. Uh, we need to develop new concepts. Uh, again, we're not alone. We're not the first people to think about this. This is a very interesting tradition already, which I'll flesh out in a, in a moment or two. And of course, not all of us architects, uh, uh, Janice is a scientist, but Jessica uh, is a social scientist with an academic, with an architectural sort of background. Uh, I'm an architect, and Johan is, is definitely with, with Janice as a scientist, but we're really pleased that they are prepared to take this risk and work with architects, because in the end, we can't just make a nice journal article, however impactful that might be. We have to be making plans and pilot projects and seeding proposals. And ultimately, we want to see things built. Uh, I think that's just deep in our own professional DNA. And I, I know many of you share that if you have these kind of hybrid uh, academic backgrounds with a background in, in design, for example. The images on the right are very famous to those of us working in, in landscape architecture and architects. Uh, in architecture is simply to demonstrate uh, that, again, we're, we're, we're not alone, we're not the first people to think about this. Uh, we don't think these, these models are adequate, but on the other hand, they're very powerful and they are the shoulders upon which we stand for this, this project. Um, just to, it's roughly the same material here, uh, the same project, so the Garden City, Broadacre City, uh, a landscape city, these are famous ar uh, architectural projects. Um, geographers maybe would recognize uh, the bioregion, so Patria Geddes and Lewis Mumford. Uh, the names are Terry McGee, De Sakota, and then John uh, Friedman, the agropolitan development. They tend to be a little bit more geographical concepts. And then interspersed amongst those are other projects like the Agricultural City by Kisha Kurokawa, uh, Agronica, um, Metabolism of Cities from Girade. Uh, uh, start from Sieverts, Foodscapes, and then most recently the Horizontal Metropolis from Palo Vigano uh, are, are all part of, I think, a common project um, from different disciplinary stances. And we, we, we will absolutely, we already have been, and we will absolutely be drawing on, these, uh, on this, this kind of legacy. Uh, and you can see one word jumping out, this, this term agropolitan, and I'll come back to that uh, in a moment. Um, the two, um, the relatively unfilled uh, column on the right is simply because we don't know yet. Uh, but we know that this is not just a theoretical question. There are many policy frameworks already out. They're already being trialed and already be, are being uh, activated in different parts. I would say mainly, uh, uh, often, I should say, in, um, in, agri in, um, in monsoon Asia countries. So the question of the United Settlement Plan, for example, is being developed and trialed in India. Uh, the reason why agropolitan is especially important for us, not only because it's significant intellectually, 
but remarkably, it has a huge uh, footprint in policy space in Indonesia. So Indonesia is mainstream John Friedman's idea, which he developed in the in the 70s and 80s um, in Los Angeles, has been mainstreamed into Indonesian uh, planning policy. So you get a lot of contemporary thinking about the agropolitan uh, framework, including their own invention now called the, the Minapolitan. Uh, and I love the, the etymology here. So agro coming from the Latin meaning land or field. Polis, I think is, is I think it's Greek, right? From, um, from city and citizen and bounded enclosure. Mina is a Sanskrit term meaning fish and, and uh, aquatic uh, productivity. So here is a beautiful kind of a new word emerging out of the, the Indonesian kind of planning settlement system planning context agropolitan and minopolitan thinking simply about what happens when you start to remove yourself from a terrestrial uh, framework and start to think about the archipelago condition as well so that's a very impressive and important challenge i, I think uh, for our work and it's a very exciting opening it's not through a, a a european or american based theorist but in fact through some policy work that's happening on the ground in a neighboring country um, the framework in which we're working, as I said, is the Future Cities Lab uh, sort of macro problematic, and we've adopted the term settlement system to try and understand that. Uh, that term had to apply to Zurich as much as it did to Singapore and to ASEAN, um, which is why it has this very sort of, uh, you know, anthropogenic uh, planetary urbanization sort of uh, granularity. In other words, it's, it's very, very high res, a very low res is a sort of idea. We position agropolitan territories within that kind of framework, um, as I said, agri field land combined with citizenship, and we want to think about the benefits of the polis uh, beyond the edge of the polis itself. So this is to do again with the benefits of density beyond uh, the edges of the city and to think about a collective development uh, rather than city centric uh, city centric uh, policy focus. Uh, urbanization of the countryside is the second point. These are, I'm drawing these uh, really from uh, from John Friedman's work. Um, this was wrote, written in the 1980s, uh, especially in the sort of Californian uh, sort of context. So we have to be very careful about the translation of these theoretical questions. But he said it's already uh, in, in the American experience, the urbanization of the countryside is already a big planning problematic that we have to start to address. And I think he was one of the leaders there with, of course, working with um, um, Mike Douglas. And, and uh, it's no accident that Terry McGee is part of that, 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 that group and that cohort. Uh, he emphasized the development of, of, of new, new typologies, new infrastructure systems. They had to be decentralized. Uh, they had to support hybrid economies. So these are rural as well as urban uh, economies and land uses. And they also had to think about uh, improving the overall ecological balance. So this is the 1970s, he was already speaking before the concepts or around the time the concepts of the ecological footprint was being developed by Wackenagel and Rees. So there's already a, a, a very important uh, 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 flagging, if you like, of agendas, which I think are still very, very powerful and, and relevant to us today. Um, <clears throat> So I'm going to take you just through a little, a slightly more empirical um, demonstration, if you like, to try and thicken that, that argument a little bit. Just three or four slides that show you a comparative framework to say, well, what would happen if you took John Friedman's idea from California in the 1970s and tried to think about it in relation to contemporary data that we have now, which, of course, massively enhanced by satellite data and a whole range of other kind of ways of, of, of gathering data. So what you see is, is basically the, the format I'll use for the next three or four slides. Um, each shows you a Northern American or European slide on the left, and then um, a, a Monsoon Asia uh, slide on the right. Um, it's used, both of them are at the same scale and using the common global data sets. And we've simply picked the intersection of two data sets that you see defined down the bottom of the, of the slide. We've taken population density at 500 people per square kilometer. Um, so this is a threshold uh, across the data. In other words, we're only recording data densities above that threshold. It's an important threshold, um, although random, but it's important because it still would be regarded as a suburban kind of density that you might find in an American or an Australian city. 
So in other words, it's still barely urban. So just keep that in mind. This is a kind of suburban density that you might find, 500 people per square kilometer. For those of you who are not used to these sorts of numbers, keep in mind Singapore is about 8,000 people per square kilometer across the whole island. That gives you a sense of sort of how dense or not dense that is. Um, and we've combined that data uh, with uh, cropland data. And this simply says where there is 40% uh, of every cell of the data has, has crop coverage in it. And we simply use that again as a random threshold. And by random, I say this could be, it could be 1,000 people per square kilometer, it could be 800, it could be 8,000. Um, but we're simply taking these two as to say, this is a suburban density in which crops are still being grown. So just keep that in mind. It, it's these two figures that we're using together. Uh, typical definitions of cities always talk about a threshold density. Um, and they always talk about the exclusion of agricultural jobs. So this is, a, this is, although random is not innocent, by including a crop, an indicator of a rural land use, we're already looking for hybrid overlapping sorts of conditions which are neither exclusively urban nor exclusively rural. So if you get that, that's the, basically the setup. Um, if, you, if you see immediately uh, the white areas on these global maps outlining where those areas are, so in Northern Europe, you can just see the very center of the UK is an area that we all, those of you who know the, the, this, the, the discipline will know that's the, that's the triangle between Manchester, Liverpool and Sheffield. So that's the first part, the first uh, flush of, of urbanization in the world in the early 19th century was happening there. And it's no accident that there's still the place that you find intense urbanization as well as intense integration with uh, productive landscapes and the, the number that I've circled below that the total population in that zone um, is around 12 almost 13 million people now by comparison if we take the same scale the same numbers the same data and look at Asia and South Asia in particular you can see that the situation is quite different um, not only is the physical footprint of that area much, much larger, you can see that the population, again, I've highlighted, is close, is, is over half a billion. So the key point here is to say that a very simple uh, non-city centric metric by, by, by using people, a certain density threshold and including an agricultural threshold, it reveals a completely different settlement system albeit from this kind of satellite view, which has consequences uh, very, for very large numbers of people. So I'm going to take you through these three slides. Um, they simply they take the same format, but we zoom in. The scale, again, is the same. Uh, and these are significant because of these are sites that we would like to work on in our research. Um, so on the left, you can see a population of around about 1 million um, at the southern end of the Boss Wash Corridor, the famous uh, conurbanation, one of the first sort of diagnosed uh, in the United States. So again, that's not the population of this region. All, the, all the, the area that you see in red is properly urban. It's just that they're not, they don't have 40% uh, crop ca capability in their backyards. And what you see in green, of course, is fully, is fully rural uh, or wilderness, but they don't support populations over the 500 people per square kilometer. So the tiny white dots are this, this very, very sharp distinction between the city and the countryside. By comparison with West Java, the figure here is there's a population of 30 million are supported inside that, that uh, arbitrary framework that we've identified. And again, for those of you who know the geography of, of the island, you can see Jakarta uh, in the top left, you can see Bandung in the middle, and the whole of that north coast uh, is subscribing to this kind of um, this kind of arbitrary statistical threshold. Uh, I think by now you start to get the gist of the, the experiment. This is the Northern Belt. So you can see Manchester uh, uh, and Liverpool here and the Peaks District. Again, similar, but much, much uh, more density. So the double uh, 2.4 million people here. But compare that with the Bengal data with um, Calcutta, you can see in the bottom left and Dhaka in the top right and here something like 95 million people in the same scale, the same kind of population uh, parameters. Southern California, uh, almost uh, 500,000. 
and the central Luzon plain. This is the region north and south of, of Manila, something like 20 million. And finally, the Po Valley, there are quite densely uh, populated sort of uh, agropolitan or desicota regions. The Po Valley between Milan and Venice, for example, is, uh, appears to have a very similar kind of pattern. But if you look at the population, that's four and a half million people inside that Po Valley and compare it with the Yangtze, which is 52 million. Again, the same scale and the same format. So that experiment is simply telling us uh, that something is real and something's happening here. Um, and the work of Terry McGee and John Friedman and other colleagues, uh, were, they, we felt that they were onto something. And we think that we can tell their story and we can extend their hypotheses in slightly more robust ways, simply because we have access to much, much more data. Um, and we can do many more things with it. Um, the project uh, Agropolitan Territories builds directly on um, a project from FCL2 uh, called Urban Rural Systems. Um, in fact, they're part of the same, the same project. And um, we're developing a series of case studies into which we then inquire in much greater detail those satellite-borne uh, data sets. So it's one thing to be able to say in a, in a, in a very global, general way, uh, these are the different uh, patterns and look how different they are and, and uh, what, 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 what might that mean. But we're also committed to thinking about what, the, what they mean on the ground because we're interested, of course, in policy and ultimately uh, 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 urban and, and, uh, and, and constructed interventions. So the ones in yellow um, are, are studies which are represented by um, a number of uh, PhD projects. So Victoria Marshall was working on Calcutta. Um, uh, Tanya Chandra was also working there. Uh, Jennifer Lee is working on Dhaka. Um, and then uh, Chen Ting was working on Chengdu and Shanghai. So we have a quite a remarkable archive. Um, and then you add to that the work of Mia Irawati um, in, in, the, in the east of, of Jakarta. Uh, we have a, a really remarkable sort of um, uh, archive of material that we would like to interact with and collaborate with over the next, next phase of the research. What we bring to it now, of course, is the, the energy and expertise of Janice and uh, Jessica and Johan, so a different disciplinary mix. And in a way, probably a more scientific mix, uh, particularly around the question of, of agriculture and food systems. So that, that, that in a way sharpens up some of the kind of broader hypotheses building work uh, from the previous phase. Um, last couple of slides now, um, what, what I meant earlier by consortium is not only the team, but we know that if we're really going to be serious about these, there's no point in making beautiful uh, plans and, and fanciful ideas. We need to have colleagues at the table as we go along. So NGOs and government agencies and industry partners are really significant, especially developers. Um, we have to have uh, uh, colleagues who are prepared to work with us. and. Um, and our, our aim, of course, is to build, bring the very best quality of data that we can find um, and, and bring that to bear and make the most sophisticated plans and approaches uh, for, the, for these, kinds of, these kinds of interventions. Um, by the physical construction, um, uh, again, I speak from experience how difficult this is. Um, this is a relatively modest project that we did in Bataan, um, but it, 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 it taught us huge amounts about the way in which research has to be in a way anchored and framed um, and, and socialized, as it's often called in Indonesian. There's a beautiful sort of a, a, a word about, about framing this, this, this kind of work. Um, the important slide here um, is, this, is, the, is the image um, on the bottom row, one in. And you can see a physical construction in the background and a fake construction in the foreground. Uh, this is printed and suspended on a, on a scaffold. And we think this can be a kind of medium for building um, a much more, a, a much larger uh, tropical town that brings the best of our research to bear into a kind of demonstration project in a kind of, uh, kind of pop-up city uh, kind of medium. So this is a site that we have been working on. We've been working with, with a developer in the, east, um, in the east of Jakarta, near where Mia has been doing her work. Um, and this is a phase diagram about how an agropolitan territory might develop over time. And next time we talk, we'll, we'll walk you through this in much, much greater detail. Um, the expandable house, you can see number four on the left, is one 
of a whole range of new typologies that we think are needed. Uh, lots and lots of architects are doing wonderful stuff and actually a lot of this stuff is already out there but it needs to be brought together in coherent ways. So in a way this is a sort of roadmap for the, the design dimensions of our work and the urban design coordinator that I mentioned at the very beginning um, you know, has a, has a really uh, a wonderfully exciting uh, uh, role, I think, in a way to, to help develop this, uh, this kind of work. So that's our story. Um, we span um, Californian theory from the 1970s and 80s uh, through, through to uh, sort of contemporary data, uh, best available data, as we always try to say. Uh, we're, we're using the, 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 the software that we developed called Earthscape. Um, but we haven't forgotten our ethnographic roots and we will be on the ground as much as we possibly can in order to bring about these kinds of, uh, uh, to, to, to manifest, if you like, the theory in high quality articles and books, but also uh, with a physical footprint, which we hope will have the smallest ecological footprint in the world of its kind. Thanks a lot. Tanvi, back to you. Thank you, Stephen. I think that's a fantastic overview. It's. Uh... It's exciting and certainly ambitious, and uh, I, I'm looking forward to seeing what uh, how this grows in the future. So the chat box is open for everyone. Please post your questions. Uh, if you have any queries, ideas, thoughts, just put it all out there. We'll try to address uh, as much as possible in the next 30 minutes. But um, Stephen, I just want to rip off of this um, agro and polis that you talked about, the land and the city. And uh, to oversimplify things, I can say, that you as an urban planner or Jessica here, uh, you would can claim the city, the polis as your domain uh, disciplinarily. And then the land, the agro uh, is maybe Johan who's studying agro ecosystems and Janice are more used to that. And uh, your series of beautiful maps of uh, the data show that the two are kind of coming together in this very interesting complex way. The city and the traditionally what we call the hinterland. And there's a increasing interaction between the two, interdependencies between the two, but also this means there's a lot more complexity, uh, which is probably why you need to bring all these actors on the table. I want to just, uh, it's very early for you and I'm sure uh, you know it's just uh, early thoughts, but I still want to understand how do you think methodologically uh, you can understand this balance uh, between the two agro and the uh, polis. And Johan, you are coming from a scientific background, particularly addressing the balance of agroecosystems through modeling and simulation. And then you as a designer showed these beautiful workshop images. And I just want to understand from each of you, the uh, all the co-eyes and PIs, uh, free and free to chime in, how they come together. That's a really great question. I'm going to I'm going to ask Johan to respond because in a way we don't know yet. Um, um, because it is a mutual, you know, reaching across, you know, distances and disciplines. and. I know scientists are suspicious of beautiful images and um, architects are suspicious of graphs and too many <laughs> formulae. I don't know, I'm being a caricature, but I think Johan, you should you should kick off. Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, I mean, it's like Stefan says, we're, we're trying, but I I would say from my own experience, uh, you know, in, in, of some of the work I've been doing in, in Africa, uh, where we're trying to also link, uh, you know, very much the, the rural to the urban areas, um, you know, they, they, what we have found to, to be working quite well is, is, first of all, really, you know, get, get a good idea of the, of the context. That, I mean, we, we call it context studies, but really actually try to identify how is that rural land effectively linked with the urban. Um, and, and so for us, being agricultural, I mean, obviously, quite often we do that through a food value chain, because it's there's lots of food that is going from the from the rural to the urban. But then also, actually, what we're finding is that in the urban, there's a lots of waste. And in many ways, that waste also has to come back to the rural. Um, and so in that sense, we're talking about circular economies, um, you know, that we, we have to do. And, and but that's all very much linked to how food is going from one to the other. And, and so, it, and in that sense, then also you, you, you have immediately quite a few of, of stakeholders involved. I mean, there's many different actors along that food value chain that we have to talk to. And so that's where I think also, you know, in, in this project, when we talk about getting NGOs involved and, and 
um, you know, government uh, institutions and, and even some of the private people. You know, it's, it's really basically doing an, a transdisciplinary approach, what I would call a transdisciplinary approach, and, and, and have all these actors involved. And we then, as scientists and, and as urban planners, you know, have to have a discussion with those stakeholders about, well, what is the link? And how can we improve it? And, and what would what makes sense to be done in the rural area versus what needs to be done in the in the urban area? And, and always think about how we are all linked, actually. I mean, quite often you, you, you know, people think that they like farmers think, well, we're just producing food. And then, you know, there's uh, consumers just think, well, fine, I'm, I, I need to have food. But clearly people are very connected. And, and so getting an understanding of that connection from a systems perspective is, is what I think is, is very important and, and can really, you know, make us go ahead and, and put in place changes that are needed to, to have this, this complexity, you know, that, yeah, somewhere resolved. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that answers your question completely, but Yes, but uh, I hear this often in other modules in global, FCM Global as well, about using systems thinking as a way to kind of bridge the uh, gap. And then it's a big, larger question of what is the system? And for you, the system is the whole agropolitan territory. Yeah. And uh, it is quite interesting to see how you start defining these territories as you go forward and how you just start defining your systems. Uh, one way to define it is soils, which is Matthew Schoensberg's uh, question. Can you speak to the... Matthew, would you like to ask the question yourself? If you would like, you can unmute. Matthew is a associate director for NFCL Global Zurich Hub. Hello, thank you for taking my question. It's wonderful to see the presentation. Thank you uh, so much, Stephen, for that. Um, I was asking if, uh, as I typed in the chat, if you could speak briefly to the suitability of soils as the underlying form determinant for land use. Specifically, there's a big discrepancy if we see the global maps of arable land, which is about 4% the surface of the earth. Um, and the land currently cultivated, it's much, much bigger area, of course, so that we're talking about degrading systems then. Do you have this? I just didn't, I didn't see it on your layers. I was wondering how much the soils factor is a kind of determining one. For you and your research? Um, I think Johan again should answer this, but I can just simply say that um, from the sort of simple, the dumb sort of data dimension, uh, we can include any data that, that's, that's, that's geospatial. So we do have soil data there, but the data we have is not especially, uh, it's not spe especially refined. So I think that's exactly one of the reasons why collaboration with uh, Johan and his team and uh, and Janice um, as well on the, on the sort of more environmental side um, is really significant. But uh, again, I, I I defer to Johan on that question. Yeah, I mean it's a it's a very good question. I think in the I mean my background is actually in soil science. I mean that's where what I did my PhD in. Uh, so you know we have digged a lot of, uh, of holes and and looked at what kind of soil there is. Um, but in in the context of of this project. I think one of the things that we, we have to really be aware of is, is that actually lots of the urban sprawl is happening on some of our best soils. You know, it, it's historically that cities were formed or are established close to the best land to be cultivated. And now we are indeed, you know, just putting concrete over it. And so this is this is a huge problem because it makes it indeed that farmers are going further away and, and are going into soils that are actually less suitable for, for farming. But that's also where I think, and that links actually to the other project that I'm involved in in the FCL, is, is where we also have to start thinking about different soil ecologies and, and actually see how we can transform soils that are maybe not as good into a functional soil system that actually can provide what we need and then and then we can even also start thinking about you know what what is the function of soil less agricultural systems and so th this is where i think you need to with working with urban planners and that we can start thinking about like what kinds of systems can we put in that can actually provide food but they are less dependent on soils 
but also what kind of things can we do to the soils that we are having so that they can become more, more productive and, and in a sustainable way. So the soil information, I think, is, is, can be uh, very useful. And, and so I'm, I'm hoping indeed that through the collaboration with, with Stefan that we can bring in some of that, that source. I mean, soil, source have been quite well characterized, so. We have another question here from Christoph. And Christoph, if you would like to uh, unmute yourself and ask yourself, that would be great. Yeah, sure. Um, so first of all, thanks for the presentation. It was really interesting. Um, I'm not an expert on this field at all, so maybe this is a stupid question. Uh, but I was wondering how um, you consider urban economics in your studies, especially when it comes to uh, deciding on land use and allocation of um, patches for, for agricultural use or for urban use, um, and how that would drive your, your research studies. Mm. I'm casting around. I don't know if any of the other colleagues um, can chip in. Um, it's true. This is a perennial question that's asked of most of FCL modules. I would say, first of all, um, we have worked very hard um, to work with colleagues uh, at NUS in, in real estate, for example. So um, that's important. But in our own particular project, uh, most of our real estate expertise will be coming through collaborations with developers. So um, the project that we're working on, and it's one of the outputs of the project, uh, is, a, is a sort of mock-up uh, tropical town, uh, agropolitan town. And in this respect, we can't go anywhere until we have uh, land values and market information, and the, the research will come directly into contact with the realities of, the, of, their, of their world. Uh, we've already experienced that uh, with the, the mock-up of the expandable house which is already, uh, it's, it's a little bit too expensive. It's a crafted building and it's a bit too expensive for the market. Um, so we would have to have another kind of set of expertise to help us translate. Um, but I was wondering if um, I saw earlier Fu Yu Ming's name pop up and I don't know if he's here. Are you here still Fu Yu Ming? <laughs> uh, in which case, could I uh, defer the question to you? Hey, you're there. Yeah, yes, I'm, I'm here, yeah. How would you respond to the question? Because we come back, we always come to you to ask, what do we do with the economics? Um, well, I, I uh, learned a little bit about your, your project earlier. Um, it's about uh, urban development uh, at the periphery of city, right, between the city and the rural area. Yeah. And uh, then, then the early question about the soil quality, I think uh, on the, uh, this conflict between the urban land use and um, the fertile agricultural land use. Um, that, that seems to be an important uh, question and, and the market may not do a good job to allocate uh, land resource efficiently. Mm -hmm. um, so we may end up um, kind of uh, um, you know, use too much uh, good soil land for, uh, for city. Uh, because the market system uh, is not uh, working efficiently and we may need um, some policy intervention to correct that, that um, a, uh, inefficiency. Um, so I think that that, that would be a, a great um, uh, kind of, um, uh, issue to, to look into you know, to see where the market system uh, is not working well and how we can design better incentives to protect the uh, the um, the soil, um, the agricultural use of uh, the best uh, soil uh, resource available. Yeah. So unless uh, I don't know, Janice, uh, Janice or Jessica have a response. I I would just re reiterate it's a really important question, Christoph, and uh, we will be leaning on people like uh, Yu Ming to help us navigate. Um, but at the moment, I hesitate to use the phrase, but it's 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 outside the scope of our expertise. Unless, again, I, I asked Janice or Jessica if you have a response or your hand. So maybe I could just lean in a little bit. Um, I think it's a really important issue. And, you know, as as a pessimist, I will say as as long as land is has a high value, uh, the demand to development is going to develop it is going to be there. And I think it's just going to be developed. So if we're really going to. Um, you know, look toward the future sustainability of our cities. We need to think about how development and 
productive landscapes can coexist. So I think a lot of what we're going to be doing in this project is thinking about multifunctional uses. Um, you know, if if and when it might be developed, then how might that be integrated with a productive landscape? And does that mean that the productive landscape has to be high tech and building integrated or infrastructure in integrated? Or is there some kind of open space that can be protected and coexist with that development? But I think these, again, Stephen, yeah, I don't think these are, are questions we'll be, we'll be addressing with this project, but I think the reality is that land scarcity and rising land prices are going to increasingly drive development. And so we have to kind of complement that. Well, thanks. I, I, I agree, Jessica. I think one thing that's interesting, uh, maybe just from the data side, I think that when we think about land prices, it's often more available or more easily accessible for urban areas. But I think when we move out of the urban context and then try to get data on price for rural context, it's a lot more challenging. Um, my group actually has got a prior interest to look into that, to try to look into online market platforms and see if we can look into collating information on land prices outside of the city context. Um, but I think that's one step maybe to try to look into for developing those kinds of questions. But again, I think coming back to the main project might be a bit out of the scope, but definitely a very interesting and important um, subject to look into. There is a new set of questions in the chat box and they're relating to very interesting special cases. Uh, so uh, one is raised by Malvika Krishnan about virtual water transfers, uh, water footprints. So when you're talking about the circular flows in the city, uh, are you talking about resource extractions that is not limited to the administrative boundaries, such as virtual water transfers that are exported from these regions to other regions? And there's a second case that uh, Arun Bandari raises about uh, agropolitan territories planning in mountainous uh, regions, uh, hilly regions, which are even more ecologically sensitive. So if uh, or any of you want to address either of these cases. I know that Jessica, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I know that you've done uh, some work on the on water systems. Um, but let me, uh, maybe I, the, the, the quick response from the more macro response is, um, yeah, it, it, it's very significant around, there's a very significant question around the question of bioregions um, and, and governance. So political jurisdictions, you know, as we tried to show in that diagram, often cut across uh, bioregions which have some other kind of integrity because they're a, a, a watershed uh, or, or, a, or a kind of delta region, for example which was then crisscrossed by multiple provincial city jurisdictions. And then, of course, managing those uh, becomes very, very difficult. So the concept of the bioregion, again, uh, is, is a bit older, but also has, has had renewed uh, uh, policy relevance lately, precisely around as this kind of uh, dual uh, governance system, so a kind of eco, uh, ecosystem services kind of approach. So in that respect, um, I think there's a lot of good material, and it's a really important direction for us. Um, it comes back a little bit. I'm pleased you raised water because um, one of the big questions with Monsoon Asia, of course, is the monsoon itself. Um, and this just puts another angle on Matthew's question around soil. Um, uh, Johan told me last time we met that, you know, rice uh, productivity, I asked the question, in what respect does rice depend on water? Um, and irrigated rice, I think, Johan, you said, is, is, is far, far more productive. So the relationship of rice, which is the dominant staple crop in monsoon Asia and the, the, the global you know, storehouse of rice, uh, depends heavily on, uh, on water as much, if not more, than soil. So the question of how we translate and move from, from soil improvement also to kind of soil less, there's already a vernacular landscape um, uh, right at our doorstep. That's as much as I can say at this stage, other than to say we have to dive into the project and, 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 and respond in more detail. Uh, the, the question about, about um, the mountainous regions pertains to that as well, in the sense that a mountain range in its relationship to um, the headlands of a river, for example, is part of this kind of bioregion relationship. Um, but it tends to be outside the scope if we use the kind of experiment that I showed which, in which in which case population densities have to be part of the story. 
Well, that's part of the hypothesis at least. And population densities are not usually very high in mountainous regions. So they t by statistical, you know, um, by statistical manipulation, they, they are inevitably outside of the realm. Unless we were to change that and say, let's put a bioregion kind of a priority, in which case these other figures would then overlay those, those case study shapes. So it's a super interesting question, other than to say I, we don't know the answer at this stage, but, but we get the significance of it. Any, any other responses from the, your co-investigators? <clears throat> I mean, maybe I, I can just add that the, the water, I mean, water is definitely going to come, come into this whole this whole project because, it, I mean, we know that water, it, I mean, the competition for water between between agriculture and the urban areas is, is only increasing. Um, and, you know, and, and currently, basically, about 70% of the of the water use is, is related to agriculture. I mean, agriculture is a very intensive water user. And, and, but obviously now we need it more and more in urban areas. And it's in many places that, you know, this, this uh, I mean, water fights are, are becoming more, more and more prevalent and, and water rights uh, are being followed for quite, quite heavily. And, and then obviously we're bringing even uh, climate change in, and, and then this is probably going to be even more so, um, you know, with, with many places having um, issues with drought. And so that's where it then, you know, what is the monsoon going to do and, and how much is it going to put even more pressure on it? And so that's where I think indeed we, we have to be, you know, thinking about how, how can we use water much more efficient. And in agriculture, there's quite a bit of work being done on that. But we do say it's like uh, Stefan was saying is, is rice is just a water intensive um, crop. You know, we can do alternate dry wet cycles, but we still need water and vegetables are, are the next one, you know, that needs enormous amounts of water. And, and so these issues are for sure going to come into play if, if we want to design a more sustainable agropolitan region. Water cannot be ignored. Mm. There's a question from Joshua here. It's a very practical question. Uh, Stephen, you and uh, also Jessica, you use more ethnographic methods of data collection uh, in your research work. So how has the pandemic affected this research? Uh, how will, how do you foresee, what problems do you foresee and what are the ways in which COVID-19 has also disrupted agriculture and transportation in these many communities that you're planning to study? Mm. Jessica, do you want to Kick off. Well, to be honest, I actually haven't been, my research has been kind of, I ended a project before COVID and now this is just ramping up. So I don't have a lot of experience doing ethnographic research. During COVID, um, it's been actually a, a nice break for me. Um, but uh, interestingly enough, uh, just kind of anecdotally, I guess, I was listening to a webinar um, I forget who hosted it, but there was someone um, representing the um, WHO and uh, I forget another um, international agency and they were talking about um, food systems um, post pandemic and what they found is actually the, the, the global food system ended up being much more stable than expected. Um, there were some slight disruptions and delays, but it, it actually rebounded quite quickly. Now I don't know how that translates on the ground in terms of more um, like smaller food, um, uh, um, smaller food chains. Uh, but that's, that's about the extent of my, um, yeah, I think as long as um, if and when we are able to start to move around a little bit more, um, I think that um, yeah, I, I, it, I think it's just going to be a real challenge for us and we're kind of holding our breaths and waiting to see what's going to happen because I think the ethnographic data is going to be a really important part of this research. So if anybody has any suggestions. I mean, most of our interaction with Johan, you've been in Kenya most of the time you've been writing this proposal, right? So <laughs> yes, that's true. <laughs> you've been doing field work. I mean, what's your experience of doing field work in Africa through, yeah. through COVID? 
I mean, so so for me, yes, in Africa, I, I've still been able to come down, although I am sitting in Zurich at the moment. But um, uh, the, I mean, one of the main challenges that we have had is, is obviously if you do this transdisciplinary approach and you, you want to bring stakeholders together, you know, I mean, actors from society together, uh, you know, with us scientists, I mean, with all the regulations, we, we were just not able to do many of these workshops. We have transferred, you know, quite a bit over to online, but as you can imagine, you know, you can do certain things online, but not everything. And, and so we've been actually really struggling, uh, you know, on how to have really an, an engaged, I mean, an engagement with, with the actors. Um, and I wouldn't say it was a complete uh, disaster, far from, but, but I am indeed looking forward to the days that, that, you know, the pandemic are over and that we can indeed sit down again uh, with the with the, with the actors of you know that that we need to act um, work together with, um, but yeah, I mean I've personally pushed it a bit also, and and I have moved out of Zurich and gone down and you know have had that COVID test about ten times now already, um, you know just just to make it happen. <laughs> I guess an, an effort needs to be made, and and you know when I go around to get my visas and, and you know, and, and last minute pull out if necessary. And then when I can go back in, I go back in. So it's it's also a bit about being dynamic and trying as much as possible to, to make things move forward. Um, but I know also that Africa is a bit different from Asia. I mean, in Singapore, it seems like everything is really locked. Um, mm. so, so it also very much depends from, from region to region. Um, but then I, I maybe I can just add also is, is like I think indeed our global food system has not been very much impacted. But one of the things that we have seen actually is that there's more and more there's much more interest uh, now in in for example um, community supported agriculture. So there's more interest in indeed having more local food chains. And so people have been sitting at home and, and have still been, but have been walking out and you know going into the into the rural area. And I guess that has actually led to having more of a sense of connection and wanting to you know even buy products from the farmers you know that they are seeing. And so these these local food value initiatives um, have actually gone up quite a bit uh, during during the pandemic. So it's an it's an interesting change that that actually has happened uh, and i think one that can be really good you know that it because i always say the biggest problem for for agriculture i think is actually that people in the city don't know anymore what it means to grow food and so if they can get a sense of that uh, then i think that's that's really good mm. yeah. janice have you been doing field work in this through this period no? i mean i will work for Looking at tropical peat restoration has all been converted online. So uh, we've been using um, online conferences and webinars to actually collect secondary data. So that means a change of the research questions. Yeah, yeah. so it's really challenging. Yeah, so we, we, we have liberty to change the research question. <laughs> I think that's a good point. But also my colleagues, uh, Debbie Saritunas and uh, Nirali have just been uh, completed um, a project on rapid response to COVID in the city of Makassar in Indonesia. And it was all done with Zoom and WhatsApp and Miro. And I was amazed, in fact, it was Miro, you know, it's a great revelation to me, but it's amazing what we could do, in fact, and how remarkably ethnographic it felt like in, in some respects. We have a couple of more questions and then I would close the session just quickly to say that Matty Demont from International Rice Research Institute, IRRI, is um, pointing out that rice does consume a lot of water, but it's also the top producer of greenhouse gases. So would you like to unmute and ask the question yourself, uh, Matty? Yes. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's very exciting to be part of this um, project. For us, it's a bit a new direction in which we're going at URI. Um, the urban element uh, is really becoming very important. We, we can see that, that most of the changes uh, will now come from the urban environment rather than from the rural environment. And so um, I think in this project, a few questions we will have to look at is, is 
rice has in fact a big environmental footprint. Um, recently, um, we presented some results internally uh, Viet from Vietnam where we showed that rice produces more greenhouse gases in Vietnam than the entire transport sector, just to give you an idea. And since we're talking about cities and, and, and how to integrate cities, uh, with rural areas, uh, th this is one of the elements probably we, we cannot avoid. Uh, so there is this water element, cities and agriculture, particularly rice competing for water. But on the other hand, uh, rice being um, a producer of greenhouse gases, um, do we want to bring the cities close? Do we want to integrate that? Or do we want to separate uh, both as much as possible? So these are questions that I'm pretty sure we don't have the answers yet. Um, but the general question I would like to ask, uh, since we are uh, part of this project, um, I'm trying to get my head around what, what could be the role um, of ERI in this project. What are our comparative advantages that we can put on the table? Just any ideas uh, would be great to hear uh, from you. I think Joe should answer that, but I can answer the, the simple one is you are already asking pretty difficult questions. So that's already a pretty important role. Um, as Urbanist, I don't think we, I would remotely have risked calling it agropolitan unless we had um, Johan and you uh, involved. In other words, we, we have to be able to ask those sorts of questions and then and then think about it from in, in a sort of collective way. But Joe, you have a, a more precise response? I mean, I think it, it <laughs> in many ways, uh, Mati, you, you gave the answer yourself. I mean, it's it's clear that rice is, is a, a very important crop in the regions that we are talking about. <coughs> And, and it is a crop that, that has issues related to it. I mean, IRI has been working for a long time on, on trying to make uh, rice cultivation more sustainable. You know, there are different uh, ways of, of approaching that, different practices. And, and you guys have a lot of experience in, in many different contexts, you know, across Asia of how, you know, what, what can, are some of the potential uh, more sustainable uh, practices for for rice cultivation, and and so this this is going to be a, a crucial part of what uh, you know of the information that we need actually for this project, um, because it is such an important and actually a bad crop. Mm. The best example I think is the straw burning in Kolkata. Yeah. And since Kolkata is part of your project. Um, I mean, we've got uh, a lot of projects on that. Huh? How can we reduce straw burning, uh, which has immediate effects on the city, the smog and all that, and all those problems. I think that this is the most straightforward example. Um, so, but it's great uh, to have your thoughts and, and we will be working on that. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. I just want to give a quick introduction to Matty um, and also to Erie for those of you who don't know. For me, this is a classic example of what happens when you as an urbanist, you, you have no idea of the profound influence of an institution like Erie uh, in the whole of the history of the Green Revolution and so on, massively influential for the way cities developed, but really not part of our normal, we don't normally think about um, the work of Erie in relation to urbanization questions. So I'm especially pleased that, um, that you're going to be involved and I hope we can find a, a good way to do it. But, but for anybody who doesn't know, look up the Erie website. I really I think it's become very, very important for for thinking about urbanization, especially in the Asian region. We are over time, but there is one more question on a topic that we haven't really touched upon yet. So if I could have a quick response, maybe Jessica, since this is your area of expertise, Daliana is asking about how the integration of farming and housing. So uh, we are very optimistic that residents will be eager to work on farms, but working with communities and villages who are already farmers will be different in comparison with having real estate housing residents were not really keen on working on farms. Yeah, I think that's that's an, an interesting observation. And one thing that I've been thinking a lot about in, um, in my research and what I'm hoping to bring to this project is, you know, we talk a lot about this urban rural dichotomy and I, and I don't think we intend it to sound, it sounds that way, but we don't intend it to be that way. There's really kind of an urban to rural gradient and so across that, you have different types of spaces in different users, different people, different social groups um, that may or may not want to be engaged in farming, for example, right? Not everybody wants to be a farmer. So I think it's our challenge to think about where are the spaces where there are people who would 
be interested in farming and where are the spaces where it needs to be a much lighter hands, like maybe starting with some community gardens or some kind of cooperative situation or where there's a productive landscape that's visible um, where people can come and volunteer. So there are lots of levels of ways to engage um, people with productive landscapes and urban farming that um, can be you know, fully in or just sort of dipping their toes in. And another thing to think about that, um, that I also want to explore a little bit more is you know, a uh, productive landscape doesn't necessarily have to feed people to be um, a, an important contribution to the city. So, um, you know, as Johan was talking about, you know, during COVID, a lot of people have started maybe growing some things, some small vegetables and pots, but they lack the skills to really understand how to grow things. So there are also opportunities for maybe city run gardens where they can have demonstrations and skill building and sort of outreach education, um, you know, um, introduction to uh, sort of exposure to culturally appropriate products um, and those sorts of things. So I think the challenge for us is that there, there are many and very diverse ways of integrating productive landscapes and being really cognizant of the type of users and the level of engagement and who's gonna maintain it and that sort of thing. So um, yeah, so these are really, really important comments. Thanks. I think we're nearing the end of the session, but always before I end any session, I like to get quick one line at a time bites from uh, sound bites from all the panelists. So I have one uh, quick last question to, for all of you. Uh, in FCL Global, we are striving to do something called transformative research. Uh, this means that we would like to create a more on-ground impact outside of our traditional disciplinary or academic silos. We want to move outside of Fit Connect and make impact. So what is the, how, where do you see your own work's transformative potential in this? Uh, uh, or to put it simply, uh, what does success look like to you at the end of four years of your research? So should we start in the order with uh, that you spoke, Stephen? Ouch, that's a difficult question. Um, well, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm going to come at this term uh, consortium. For me, um, I'm, I'm so excited about the research. I, this discussion for me has been very helpful. We've met two or three times, but, but this, this is, has been very exciting. Um, but what happens with that research when it lands? And for me, it's going to be very, very interesting to talk to developers. Um, and I, I'm looking forward to producing basically a pop-up agropolitan town. Um, and I invite everybody to come and join the consortium. We will, we will bore you to death with advertisements about it. Um, and, and I really, really hope to see it physically on the ground, even if it's in a kind of pop-up framework. So I'm interested in that me sort of medium, that new kind of weird medium between uh, uh, academic work and, and developer work. Pop-up agropolitan town in four years, that would be exciting. Uh, um, Johan, you wanna go next? I mean, for me, it's a, it's the first time I'm I'm actually working with urban planners and, and architects, and and so uh, you know I'm very excited about that, and and but that's also where I think you know if 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 I can actually have the architects thinking a bit more about agriculture and and also their the, you know the actors that they have been using uh, or that they have been working uh, with in the past. If also them can have more of an idea of how they are very much linked, you know, towards to agriculture, then I think I I, I will be very satisfied. <laughs> Great, um, Jessica, you go next. Hey, um, I guess for me, uh, my what I really want is for us to understand the diversity of options to integrate productive landscapes in the city. I think that, you know, um, the trend has been towards high tech options, which are really great, but we need to think about the many and diverse ways that we can grow food and even other non edible products in the urban context. Um, and integrate them with other functions. So how can we leverage other needs of the city and integrate that with food or other product production. That would make me, that would make me happy. <laughs> Fantastic. And Janice, you want to go next? 
Thanks, Stanley, for the question. Um, I think this is a project that's very different from what I normally work on. And I think it's very exciting to be working with people who are from architecture and um, urban planning. I think for me, it's really the creative application of our diverse skill sets and knowledge, and then to try to look for these solutions in um, these rapidly developing cities. Um, so I think it's really exciting. I mean, for me, it's really just like seeing that knowledge and skill set being applied in a new creative way. That to me would be a very successful um, outcome from, from this project. Great. So in four years, we can creatively apply knowledge and skills uh, to build productive landscapes uh, by architects who are now finally thinking about agriculture in a pop-up agropolitan town. And with that uh, ambition in mind, I would like to close this session. Thank you everyone so much for staying till the end. And if you want to get in touch with us, we are always open for uh, dialogue and uh, collaboration. So just get in touch. Thank you. Thanks, Tandy. Thank you everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.